so the plan is to continue our discussion about fluids um, and get into Archimedes principle. Last time we, uh, we went over a few concepts. The first of course, being the pressure depth relationship whereby uh, we have an equation that tells you how much pressure an object would feel because of how deep it is under a fluid. So the more you dive down in the water, the more pressure you're gonna feel. But exactly what is the mathematical relationship? Well, it's pretty easy. It says the pressure that you will feel is given by the density of the fluid times gravity, 9.8 the acceleration due to gravity, uh, times the distance in depth uh, you actually are under the water. Uh, H they use, it's the same as height in uh, conservation of energy. They just use the same letter again. It just means distance. How far down do you go? And again, the important thing is to remember that this density is the density of the fluid we're talking about. And the reason I say this is because when we get into Archimedes principle, we're going to find that uh, there are two different densities we have to keep track of. One is the density of the fluid, and the other is the density of the object that's in the fluid. Well, for here, it's pretty easy to understand that if you want to know how much pressure you feel because you're underwater, it should depend on the water. It shouldn't depend on you. You know, you're a certain depth. If the water is really dense, it should give you a lot more pressure. If it's a very light uh, fluid, like air, then you should feel less pressure. So that's why it depends on the density of the fluid. It doesn't matter the density of the object that's in the fluid. No matter what object you put, it always feels the same pressure. And then we also talked about uh, a concept of um, the apparent weight of an object. And this was the fact that when a f an object is placed into a fluid, and let's say it sinks, or if it floats, but usually we talk about if the object sinks, then we find that if we try to measure the weight of the object while it's in the fluid, it actually feels lighter than it does when it's not in the fluid. And so it's easier to pick up heavy objects that are underwater than just sitting there on the ground. And that's because when an object is in a fluid, we already know that the object feels a pressure due to the fluid pushing on it from all sides. And the fact that the object has a certain size means that the top of the object will never be as deep as the bottom of the object. So if the bottom of the object is deeper than the top and the pressure it feels depends on how deep it is, then of course, you're gonna have more pressure at the bottom of the object than on the top. And if you have more pressure on the bottom than the top, that means there's more force pushing up from the bottom than the top. And so there's some extra force trying to lift the object when it's in a fluid. That force we call the buoyant force. And so when we go to measure the weight of an object, what we find is that the apparent weight, how heavy something feels, is whatever its true weight is, actually is, minus how much buoyant force is acting on the object, right? The more buoyant force it feels, the lighter it's gonna be until the buoyant force is so big that it's bigger than the weight of the object and it floats. Well, if you try to measure the weight of an object that's floating, of course it has no weight, it's floating. But if the buoyant force is not quite big enough to overcome the weight, it's something less than a the weight, then it'll just make the object feel lighter. It won't ever feel as heavy as, a, as the object would, let's say in the air or in a vacuum. So those were the two big things we got last time. And then I also discussed the concept of a gauge pressure. So gauge pressure goes like this. I'll spell it out there, gauge pressure. Well, this is important in kind of real life uh, 
for instance, if you have a bicycle pump, you go to pump up a tire, and while if the tire is flat, when you plug the bicycle pump into it, it's got a little gauge on there that tell you the pressure, how much air is in the tire. And if the tire is already flat, you plug it in, and it says that there's zero pressure in the tire. But we know, because we're physicists or we're scientists, we know about this stuff, that actually it's not zero. The fact that the tire is in the atmosphere, it's in air, air is a fluid, and every fluid provides pressure to the object it's in, then there must be some pressure on the tire. And that, of course, is called atmospheric pressure. And it's a certain amount. It's a constant, depending on where you are on Earth, how far up on a mountain or how low to the ground you are. The atmosphere is pushing on everything with the same amount of pressure. Now, the fact that uh, there is some set level of pressure on every single object on Earth means that we don't really have to worry about it. All we really worry about in our everyday lives is how the pressure changes. So in other words, the bicycle tire pressure may be 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals because of atmosphere, but who cares? What I want is to pump up the tire so that it's full of air. It's got more pressure than it did before. So I go to 32 PSI or 53 PSI or whatever your particular tire is. So we always care about the difference. How much does the pressure change? And that's what's called the gauge pressure. And so what we have is an equation that kind of looks like this. Um, the gauge pressure, it's called P gauge, is whatever the true pressure is, the total or absolute pressure minus atmospheric pressure. Okay, so like I said, you have a bicycle tire and it's flat. Well, there's some air in the tire, it's just whatever air naturally fills up the space, but it's not pumped up yet. So there's some amount of pressure there, it's called atmospheric pressure. So the total pressure on this empty bicycle tire is atmospheric pressure. But to you, you don't care because that's a flat tire. What you care about is the gauge pressure, how much extra pressure there is from its normal state. And so that's what instruments would generally say. You're in a, you got a scuba tank with oxygen. Well, once the oxygen is quote unquote empty, once the tank is empty, you've used up all the oxygen, there's not really no oxygen in the tank. There's some. There has to be some because it's an open container. There's a container. It has to be filled with something. It's just that once it gets down to the point where you can't suck the oxygen out of it anymore because you would create a vacuum, we may as well call that zero because we can't access whatever's in there. It's as if there's nothing there. And so that's what this gauge pressure does. It allows us to only care about the important stuff. And so this pressure depth relationship over here, that's really an equation about gauge pressure. Because for instance, let's say I were to actually do a calculation and I say there's an object on the beach uh, and it hasn't gotten into the water yet. So it's at zero depth. I could ask how much pressure is acting on the object. Well, you could give me two answers. Number one, you could say, well, there's zero pressure because the depth is zero, it's not under the water yet, so the water's not pushing on it. But of course, we know in reality, there, it's not that there's zero pressure acting on the object, there's some pressure, and that's the atmospheric pressure. It's just that there's not more extra pressure due to the fluid, due to the water. So this equation really is the, a gauge pressure. So when, you're, when you have questions, when you have homework problems or test questions or things like that, be very careful when you read it to ask yourself, what is it the problem wants? Am I being asked for the absolute pressure or the total pressure acting on the object? Or am I asked for the gauge pressure? If I want the gauge pressure, then it's just the rho GH, that's it. If I want the total pressure, then it's rho GH plus atmospheric pressure. 
however much extra pressure there is just due to the atmosphere by itself and no other effects. And of course, the number for the atmospheric pressure will be given on a test. You don't have to memorize what that constant is, but just know it exists. And so when you're doing the homework problems or the practice problems that are posted, if you ever get a slightly different answer, that may be why. Maybe you, you gave me gauge pressure and what I wanted was the absolute pressure. So just make sure you read the question and understand which one it wants, gauge pressure or regular. So that's what we did last time. Now today what I'd like to do is introduce a big part of fluids, which is called Archimedes principle. And Archimedes principle is actually like a combination of several equations or several concepts. Um, the story uh, goes like this. Uh, a king was given a crown and he wanted to make sure that uh, this gift of a crown was a real gift and it wasn't fake. In other words, is the crown that was given to me actually made of gold or is it fake? Is it some other metal and they made it look like gold? And of course, way back in the you know, Greek times, they didn't have fancy machines to be able to detect what type of material things are. And so they had to come up with uh, interesting ways of being able to determine these things. And so uh, one of the things uh, that was done, the king went to his scientist, his court scientist named Archimedes, and said, I give you this project. Determine for me whether my crown is made of gold. And so Archimedes would have access to the crown. He could pick it up. He could do measurements on it, whatever he wants to do. Of course, he can't destroy it. Uh, he has to, it's a crown and he has to keep it as a crown. He can't melt it down and make a bar out of it or anything like that. He has to keep it like it is, but he can measure its size, measure its weight, things like this. And so what Archimedes felt was he said, look, every different metal has a different density. That is how heavy they are based on their size. Aluminum, for instance, is very light relative to its size. So if you have a bar of aluminum, it actually feels pretty light compared to what you would think a piece of metal would feel like. And gold is a different density and lead, of course, is even more dense and, and all this kind of stuff. So different metals have different densities. And so he said, well, if I could figure out the density of this crown, I could compare it to the density of these other metals and see which metal it must be. If the crown has the same density as gold, then I could safely say the crown is made of gold. If the density is something else, then I could look up and see what other metal has this density that this particular crown has. So that's kind of how he wants to do it. He's gonna use the density of the object to figure out what it's made of. Well, here's the issue. If you remember density is the mass of the object divided by its volume. So he has to be able to calculate this using the crown. Well, the first part's easy. The mass, that's no problem. He just gets his little weight scale and he measures the mass. He balances out and he gets how much, you know, what's the weight of the object? And he knows weight is mass times gravity. So he's able to determine the mass of the crown. Perfect. No problem. The issue is the volume because, of course, the crown. It looks, you know, like a crown would look. It's weird shaped. It's got all these spikes. You know, it's roundish, but it's not perfectly round. It's not a cylinder. They would know how to calculate the volume of a cylinder back then. It's not a sphere. It's not a cube. It's some weird shape. And so the issue is how in the world do I determine the volume of this weird shaped crown? They didn't have access to calculus back then. That wasn't invented for another few uh, thousand, you know, few thousand years. So this was an issue. 
And this was the crux of his problem. Archimedes had to figure out a way to determine the volume of this object when all he knows is how to calculate the volume of regular shapes. And remember, it wouldn't be too bad if the king would let him just take the, take the crown, melt it, and create a, a, you know, a cube or a bar of metal from it. Because then he can make it a, a cube, and then he knows how to calculate the volume of a cube. He can't change the shape. He can't break it up into pieces. So he thinks about it. He's not, you know, he's really worried, obviously. You don't want to make the... <laughs> Uh, king angry if the king gives you a project you better fulfill the project or else he's going to be getting a new uh, court uh, scientist so there he is he decides uh, he gets in his bath and thinks about the problem and that's when it hits him when he gets into his bathtub what he finds let's say this is the bathtub here so here's the water level in the bathtub when he gets in he notices, so here he is now laying in his bathtub. What he finds is the water level has now risen above where it was. And in fact, some of the water spills over outside of the bathtub. And that's when it hits him. And in fact, he says the famous line, Eureka. Because uh, he's figured something out. He said, look. Whenever you put an object in a container that has a fluid, the fluid level rises. And so you ask yourself, why would the fluid level rise? Well, it makes sense. The water or the fluid was taking up whatever room it could take up in the container. It takes up as, as little room as possible. When you put something else in there, so let's say I put like an ice cube right here, well, all the space that this ice cube takes up now used to be taken up by water. But you move the water out of the way to put this new object there. Well, the water had to go somewhere. So that water that's moved from that location now goes up, moves around. And so all the water shifts so that now the water level rises a little bit. And what he figured out was, well, obviously the amount of shift, the amount that the water level rises, better have something to do with the size of the object you put in there. If you put a big object in the water, the water level will rise a lot more than if you put a little bitty object. And in fact, it must be that it's exactly the same amount. If I have an object of a certain size, then an amount of water equal to the size of that object will be moved out of the way or what's called displaced, displaced. It's just moved to another location. It was here, you now put this ice cube in or you put the body in or whatever it is. And so that water is now displaced to a new location. And so what he figured out was that the volume of an object placed into a fluid must be equal to the volume of the fluid displaced by the object. It sounds way more complicated than it actually is. All it says is if you know how big an ice cube you put into a glass of water, then the water level will rise equal to the size of the ice cube. And when we say size, what we mean is volume specifically, because these are three dimensional objects. So if I put an object of, uh, you know, three cubic centimeters into my water, then the water level will rise by three cubic centimeters to make room. So what he determined is this, look, I can figure out the volume of the object very easily. All I have to do is get a container. Here's a container. Fill it with water all the way to the top. All the way to the very top. And then I'm going to place this in a separate container that's much bigger so that when I put my object, the crown, let's say, so we'll say this is the crown here, that's gonna make the water level rise over the top 
and that water will spill down into this kind of outside bucket here, and he'll be able to collect all that water. He'll take that water and he will put the water into a container which is of a regular shape. So let's say a cube or a cylinder or something like that. And he knows how to calculate the volume of a cylinder. So all he has to do is take a cylinder of water of a certain height, and he knows the volume of a cylinder is uh, pi r squared h. That's not as important as the concept here. If I want to know the volume of this weird shaped object, well, I don't have to, I don't have to measure the object. Instead, I'll measure it indirectly. I'll place the object in this fluid. The fluid level will rise and the water will you know, flow over the top. I'll capture it into a separate container. That container will be of a very special shape that makes it easy for me to figure out its volume. And so I calculate the volume of the water that was displaced. And then, of course, by intuition, the volume of the water displaced by an object must be the volume of the object itself. That's why it was displaced. It made room for this new object. So that's the first big discovery by Archimedes. And so with that and his ability to measure the mass of the crown when it's not in the water, he's able to determine the density. All right. Now there are there are some more concepts he figured out which we'll go through. But before I get to them, are there any questions about this concept? The volume of an object placed into a fluid is equal to the volume of water displaced by the object. All right. Well, if that's understandable. And it is intuitive once you think about it. You may not realize it at the beginning, and that's what made your, uh, Archimedes pretty smart, was this effect was seen by everyone, but no one ever thought to use it in some kind of a way that would be helpful. It's just, you know, people noticed it, but never thought, why does the water level rise or anything like that? But that's not all he did. He then did a bunch of experiments with this. For instance, another thing he, he realized was when I place this crown in the water, and I, let's say I want to do an experiment for some other object, I've already done the crown, so that's boring. Let's say I have some other object that's weird, and I want to do the same thing. Well, let me devise an experiment that lets me get the mass of the object and its volume at the same time. Why do it in two steps? Usually, you would measure the mass of the object using your little weight scales. And then afterwards, you put it in this uh, bucket of fluid and you do, you do your business. What he said is, hey, look, let's just measure the mass at the same time we're measuring the volume. But what he realized was when you try to measure the mass of the object when it's in the water, it's not the same as the mass when it's outside of the water. And of course, we already know that. That's what this apparent weight thing says. The true weight of the object is the weight when you measure it outside of a fluid, just in the air, let's say. However, when it's put into a cup of water or a bathtub or whatever, and you measure its mass or its weight, you measure it to be a lot less. And so he said, well, okay, that's kind of weird, but let's go with it. Is there some relationship here? Because I already found one relationship that's really nice. The volume of the object is the same as the volume of the water displaced. Is there another relationship that has to do with the weight? And so what he did was he measured the, uh, the weight of the object in the air. And so he was able to get the true weight. Then he measured the weight of the object while it's in the fluid. And so he's able to get the apparent weight. Okay, so let's say it measures 100 pounds when it's outside the fluid, you put it in the fluid, now it only measures 80 pounds. Okay, it's lighter. So there's some difference here. And so what he realizes is, okay, the difference I'm going to call something. So he says, take the true weight minus the apparent weight. 
And I'm going to call that buoyant force. Okay. Buoyant force. So it's this extra weight that's kind of lost, this extra force that was acting on the object, but when I put it in the water, now it's not acting on it. There's this extra force missing. And I'm going to call that thing buoyant force. Then he says, is there a way for me to measure the buoyant force without doing this? So is there something else that also happens to be equal to the buoyant force? Because may maybe I don't want to measure the true weight and then the apparent weight. It may be difficult to measure the weight of an object while it's in water. So is there something else I can measure that would give me the same value? And so he thought about it for a little bit and he decided, well, you know what I can do? I put the object in the water, the water level rises, and that water, let's say if it's at the very tip top of the container, it overflows. I capture that overflowed liquid. Well, he measured the weight of that liquid. And sure enough, the weight of the water displaced by the object happens to be equal to the buoyant force acting on the object. So that's the next big discovery. The weight of the water displaced, when you put an object in fluid, that fluid is displaced. If you measure the weight of that displaced fluid, so only the fluid that was moved, it equals the buoyant force that acts on the object. And the buoyant force, of course, is the difference between the true weight and how heavy something feels. So bam, another big relationship that may be helpful when determining things. And then of course, he uses a little mathematics. He says, all right, well, that's pretty good. Um, but you know, I don't always know these particular things. Instead, let me rewrite this relationship in terms of physical values I know. And so he does some fancy arithmetic. What he says is this, weight of the water displaced, of course, that's the mass of the water displaced times gravity. Weight is mass times gravity, that we know. And so the weight of the water displaced is however much mass of water is displaced times 9.8. And then he says, yeah, but I know when we deal with fluids, we're never talking about the mass. What we talk about is density. So then he uses the fact that density is mass over volume. So he solves it for mass and he finds out mass is density times volume. So what he does is he replaces the mass variable with this, density times volume, because those are physical characteristics. The mass you have to measure, you know, you go get your little uh, weight scales and you measure the mass. Density and volume are other physical characteristics you can get. And so now, once he replaces it, he finds out that the weight of the water displaced is the density of the fluid times. Uh, the volume of the fluid, oops, times G, times 9.8. And then the same can be done for the buoyant force. And when we do that, what we find is that rho times V times G for the fluid is equal to rho times V times G for the object. But remember rho has to be rho for the fluid as well from our previous uh, talk about the pressure depth relationship. Pressure depth relationship said the pressure should depend on the fluids material, not the object. And so this is what we get. This relationship becomes this relationship. Or if I rewrite it, density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid 
times G is the same as density of the fluid times the volume of the object times G. How can we, um, the density sign and the rho sign looks alike, so how? Yeah, 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 density is rho, they're the same thing. Oh, okay. So rho, rho is the, the letter rho, the Greek letter rho, but what it stands for is density. So yeah, sometimes I call it rho, just, I don't know why, and sometimes I call it density, but it is density the whole time. Good, good. And so this is the thing about Archimedes principle. Some people like it, some people don't. It's these three relationships, okay? It's volume of the object that you place into a fluid will be the same as the volume of the fluid that's displaced by the object. Then there's the weight of the water displaced by the object is the buoyant force which acts on the object. And then there's this relationship that allows you to compare um, the density times volume times G for the fluid and the object. These three things kind of combine when you're working an Archimedes problem. Okay, you're not always gonna use all three. Sometimes you may only use one, sometimes you'll use two, but all three are listed there because what you don't know is when you get a problem, what pieces of information will you know? Sometimes you know a lot about the object. And if you know a lot about the object, then you'd use this side over here. But sometimes you don't know a lot about the object, like with the crown, how the heck do we know the volume of the crown? Well, we don't. So instead we know the volume of the fluid that was displaced by the crown. So we'd use this left side over here instead. And the fact that they're equal to each other means it doesn't matter which side we use. When we talk about the weight of the water displaced, if I happen to know the volume of the object, then it's the density of the fluid times the volume of the object times G. If I don't know the volume of the object, then what I'd have to do is know the volume of the fluid that was displaced. And so I'd use the left side instead, but they both mean the same thing. They're both the weight of the water displaced. And what is that useful for? That's useful for when I want to calculate the buoyant force which acts on an object. If I know the buoyant force which acts on the object, then I can answer questions like, you have a, uh, a particular rock of a certain material. Uh, it weighs this much in the air. If you were to place it into, the, into water, how heavy would it feel? Well, if I want to, if I want to figure that out, I could use this particular uh, relationship here: the true weight minus the apparent weight is the buoyant force. So, if I want the apparent weight, I need to know the buoyant force acting on the object and the true weight of the object. Well, how do I get the buoyant force? You get the buoyant force by saying the weight of the water displaced. I can measure that. Or I could calculate it, calculate it using rho times V times G, the third relationship. So they're all connected. It's not like, oh, this particular relationship is used when this and this and this happens. The second relationship is for this. It, you know, it's not like Newton's three laws of motion, where, you know, one of them is an object in motion stays in motion. And then another one is F equals MA. And then another one is an equal and opposite reaction business. Each one has its purpose. Here, Archimedes principle has three relationships, but they're all interconnected. They're all relating things to each other so that when you get a problem, when we discuss Archimedes principle, you have these tools, these relationships that you could use to figure things out. So it's almost like a puzzle where I say, okay, you know this, and I want you to get to that step there. Well, how in the world do you take this little bit of information I give you at the start of the problem and make it all the way to the end? Well, you use these different relationships however you can. Sometimes you could use them, sometimes you can't. And each question is slightly different. But that's Archimedes' principle. 
It's these three relationships really put together. Now, one more thing in the theory section I want to talk about, and I think next time we'll do actual examples, but I want to go through the theory so we have all of our equations set up. Um, the, uh, this one is it's kind of an easy relationship. Um, it may not be straightforwardly clear that it's true, but the fact that it's true means you can answer what would be a fairly complicated question fairly easily. And it goes like this. Let's say uh, you're standing there at, at a, a pier or a dock and there's a big old ship in the water. And you notice that the ship uh, is about, you know, one third of the ship is underwater and the two thirds of it is above the water. Okay, so a ship has one third of its volume submerged. And two thirds above the surface. The question is, what is the density of the ship? Now that's a very complicated question. Because remember, if we want to know the density, we need two things. We need the mass of the object, so we need to be able to measure the weight or the mass of a big old ship. But worse than that, we need the volume of the object. Well, a ship is a very complex shape. Okay, even if you get the most basic child's drawing of a boat, that's still difficult to figure out the volume of that shape, much less an actual ship. And so the hope is to find a relationship that would make this fairly easy. And a relationship is, is very easy. Thank God it goes like this. The percent, I'll do it in black, percent of an object submerged in a fluid is given by the ratio, or you're dividing two things, the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid. Surprisingly, very easy. Now I could rewrite it. That would make it a little bit more helpful. Percent submerge means how much of the thing is underwater versus the total amount of the thing. So this is also a ratio. And it says on the bottom, we'll say the total volume of the object. Total volume. The top is how much of that volume is underwater. And so we can say the volume submerged. So the volume of the object submerged divided by the total volume tells me the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid. And so now this question is fairly easy. If a ship, if one third of a ship is underwater, then the volume submerged is one third of the ship the total volume is the whole thing, one, like 100%, is equal to the volume of the object, I mean, the density of the object, which is what I want, over the density of the fluid. Let's say I'm in water. Well, that's just a thousand. So I calculate density of the object. I move the thousand to the other side. I get the density of the object is one third times a thousand, 333 kilograms per meter cubed. Very easy calculation. And I don't have to calculate the mass. I don't have to go get a weight or a scale or something like that and measure the mass of my boat. I don't have to go try to calculate the volume. However, in the world I can do that. Instead, I look at how much of the objects underwater, how much is over the water. That's the percent submerged. And it happens to be equal to the density of the object over the density of the fluid. So very, very easy relationship. And this lets you do interesting things. For instance, 
you can ask uh given um let's say here's something i want you to do yeah for next time this is your homework very easy homework um we've all heard uh kind of the the theory that when you look at an iceberg most of the iceberg is actually underwater well, let's check to see if this is true. What I want you to do is calculate the percentage or the fraction of an iceberg submerged in the ocean. Okay. So this is kind of like a, a homework problem. You're not turning it in, but you're gonna do it just for next time. Just see if you can do it. What do you need to know for this? Well, the density, remember ocean, ocean water is salt water. So you need the density of salt water. Iceberg, pretend it's just ice, regular ice water. I mean, just ice. So you need the density of ice. And then if you want uh, the fraction of the iceberg submerged, well, remember that's uh, percent submerged equals density of the object, which in this case is the iceberg over density of the fluid that the object is in. In this case, it's the salt water. And so that's how you'll be able to do it. So just look up the, the values on Google or something, plug them in and you'll see. If it says, uh, if you get something like 0.9, that means 90% of the iceberg is under the water. If you get something like 0.1, that means 10% of the iceberg is under the water. So when you do this, you'll be able to, you'll get a number, which is a percentage or a fraction. And that'll tell you how much, when you look at an iceberg, how much of that total iceberg is actually under the water versus how much you see above the water. So an interesting little calculation just to prove whether that whole theory people talk about, uh, most of the iceberg is underwater, see if it's actually true. But this is another relationship we use a lot. So from this section, we have four relationships. We have the three from Archimedes, and then we have this uh, percent submerged calculation. And with all of that, we're now going to be done with the theory part of fluids. So what we're going to do next time, a bunch of examples, probably do examples again on Wednesday. And then we're going to be having a second test coming up. Because what I'd like to do is make sure each test is on one big topic. I don't want to combine fluids with something else. So although it hasn't been that long since our last test, this topic is not all that you know, long relative to other topics. So the second test is coming up. When can you expect it? Let's say we'll probably have an exam review on Friday of next week, which means we'll have the test Monday of the following, something like that. Um, of course, if we get through the examples very quickly, if everybody understands everything very quickly on Monday, then we could just have the exam review on Wednesday instead. And then Friday will be the test. But it's one of the two. It just depends how slow it, it, uh, it is to get through some of these examples. But with this stuff, we're now done with the topic of fluids. Um, so that's that. So next class, example problems, we'll see how far we get, and then potentially more example problems on Wednesday, if not the exam review. Uh, what else? Um, be on the lookout for one more homework assignment on Archimedes principle before the test. Uh, I'll probably post it uh, today or tomorrow and have it due sometime next week. Of course, I can't, I'm not gonna have it due Monday before we get to examples, but it'll be posted. So if you wanna go ahead and work on it, you'll be able to, again, I'll have the previous year's recorded lectures on Canvas. You'll be able to look ahead, look at some examples 
uh, just to kind of um, to make sure you're aware of what's going on. And then uh, we'll get to examples ourselves on Monday. So be on the lookout for that stuff. It's all on Canvas. And of course, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me. But that's all I have for you today. So if you don't have any questions, you're free to go and enjoy your weekend. I'll see you next time. Yes, question? Someone have a question? I know um, our final is until way later, but I was trying to see if that's still going to be online. I'm just trying yeah. to see. Like yeah, I believe uh, that actually the university wants all final exams to be online, if I remember correctly. <laughs> so even if our tests were not online, I think everybody's final has to be done virtually. Uh, so yeah, that and even if not, we will have ours virtually either way. But I believe it's the rule of the university for all exams should be virtual this semester. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. <clears throat> Hi, um, Dr. Ross Manneth. Yeah, what's up? So um, I've been um, absent from class for about a week or going on two weeks because I had surgery done um, on me last week or so, well, a week ago or so. Or so. And okay. I thought that academic affairs was going to communicate to my professors because I was told to go to them to submit some documentation. And disability services were supposed to reach out explaining what happened and everything. Mm. But I was I'm unable to um, submit some of the work that I missed and was told that I was unable to make up any work until academic affairs is, um, you know, sent out what they're supposed to send out. Okay. Um, and what I would do is, uh, for me at least, uh, go on to Canvas, see which assignment uh, you missed. You know, I, I don't really know off the top of my head to tell you, but whatever homework things you missed or anything like that that should have been submitted, send me an email to let me know and I'll open up the deadline for you specifically to give you a, a few days to go ahead and work on it to be able to submit this stuff. Yes, sir. Yeah, so go ahead okay, and do that just so I know which, which things I need to modify the deadline on. Yeah, and I'll be happy to do okay. that. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. No problem. All right. Enjoy your weekend. You too. Thank you. All right.